you. Um, so we've talked about this perfect moment of history, this very brief time where all of those origins came together, created rock and roll. It only lasted for a few short years and then it died. Okay. And last week we talked about all the different ways that the artists either, um, either something happened to them or they did something that was like not so great. And, um, they were kind of out of commission, you know, they weren't, they weren't, um, making music. And also the payola scandal that kind of put the beat down on a lot of those DJs that were playing rock records. So for a while, a little while, things were a little tamer. And a lot of the rock and roll haters thought they had won. Like, haha, we have defeated it. We will now go back to listening to like <laughs> some music that is the squarest and the whitest. Um, but anyway, the other thing that happened, and that's kind of what we're going to start talking about, is some people noticed that there was a market there for this type of music. And they were like, huh, we can make some money off of this. So now we see people trying to manufacture good music, okay? Because before, you know, like Little Richard, for instance, he listened to his influences, came up with a cool song with his band, okay? Now, business people, musicians would get together and they would write a song and then they would like give it or assign it or whatever to a group that was under contract. And they'd be like, you're going to sing this. And that's a little bit more how it happens today. Like not entirely. It's a mix, I'd say, today of people that write their own stuff and people that have stuff written by record companies. Um, this was sort of a new idea. And the most famous um, hit factory of this era, we're going to talk about Motown, which is the most famous hit factory for black music um, when it came to like that R&B Motown sound, which we'll talk about. But for now, we're looking at more... Um, the bubblegum pop rock type music. And um, the cool part was these groups, they had white and black groups. So that was kind of neat. Um, and it was definitely a moment of integration for sure. But what we're going to talk about right now is the wall of sound. Okay. Now the wall of sound um, is, the disc is what we call a formula developed by Phil Spector. When I say formula, I don't mean like chemical formula. I mean, they figured out how to make hits, okay? They had people that would figure out these catchy chord progressions. They figured out how to layer sound in the studio. They would use um, the attractiveness of the singers and the artists, and they dress them up with, you know, cool hair and beautiful outfits or cool, good looking suits or whatever. And they would like sell music, okay? But again, it was more of a manufactured process. So the Wall of Sound was a music production formula developed by record producer Phil Spector at Gold Star Studios in the 1960s. The group of producers and session musicians who turned out these hits were known as the Wrecking Crew. So the producers are the ones that are in the booth, pushing all the buttons, making all the decisions. Like, hey, let's do this here, add this guitar here, let's bring that volume up, right? They're kind of like the musical directors. A session musician is a musician who really only plays in the studio. So they don't typically go on tour. They don't typically like play out at clubs. They usually work for the record company and they just play on recordings, which if you're very, very talented is a good spot to be in because you can make some money, but you don't have the crazy schedule of touring. Um, so this group was called the Wrecking Crew because they would literally just create these amazing hits and just destroy the competition. Um, their method of music production created an, an unusually dense orchestral aesthetic that came through well on both radios and jukeboxes of the time. So again, we're kind of limited by the technology, right? We can only make music that <clears throat> that um, can be handled by, if you're listening on a tiny transistor radio, you're not going to get the same sound as someone who has like a full modern Bluetooth stereo in their living room, right? So Phil Spector's Wrecking Crew was able to produce records that sounded full and good on radios and jukeboxes. Again, something we don't really think about these days but uh, as much, but this was groundbreaking for the time. Um, and the orchestral aesthetic, what that means is it had a more full depth of sound. Like some of the old rock and roll stuff, you just have piano, drums, bass, and vocals. It's more simple. This would have layers of percussion and strings and brass 
and vocals and harmony and layers and layers. And they would do all this in the studio and create these orchestral sounding songs, which was, again, kind of new for pop music. Um, the Wall of Sound arrangements called for large ensembles of musicians and multiple instruments doubling or tripling parts to create a fuller and richer tone. Okay, so let's say you wanted a string sound. Instead of just having like one cello, maybe you would have the same person record the same part three times, you layer them all together in the studio, and now it sounds just richer and fuller. So they would beef up the music in the background of these tracks. And when we listen to them, when you listen to them, I should say, on Spotify, you're going to hear what I'm talking about. You'll be like, oh, I hear it. They're just these. When you hear a Phil Spector song, you know it's a Phil Spector song because of the layers. Okay. All right. Um, he also used reverb from an echo chamber. And you can hear this too when you hear like, boo, 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 boo. When you hear that snare, the coo, instead of it just being, you get this, coo, right? There's like this reverberating echo effect. Again, when you hear it, you'll go, oh, that's what Olsen's talking about, right? Um, very common in Phil Spector's music. He called it a Wagnerian approach to rock and roll. Now, we didn't have time to talk about Wagner, but Wagner was an, an opera composer in the Romantic period. Um, and he wrote the most intense full operas of the time that were just like crazy. So he took that approach and put it to pop music and rock music. Little symphonies for the kids. Spectre and his team wrote and arranged hit after hit in the 1960s and put the Ronettes, the Crystals, Tina Turner, and the Righteous Brothers on top of the pop charts. Okay. So here in these photos, we have Phil Spector. Here he is. Here he is with, I think that's the Ronettes. Um, here's some of the session musicians. You can see how many people are in the room as they're recording, as opposed to like when Elvis was on stage with just a drummer and a bass player. So you can see how much different that is. Here he is behind the soundboard. He's kind of a kooky figure, and it's only going to get weirder, so just wait. So here's some biographical stuff about Phil Spector. Phil Spector was born... Harvey Phillips Spector on December 26, 1939 in New York City. He broke onto the music scene in 1958 with his band The Teddy Bears as the singer and guitarist. The group charted one hit single entitled To Know Him Is To Love Him. In 1960, he co-founded Phillies Records and at the age of 21, like I'm 31, just to give you perspective, that's insane. At 21, he became the youngest ever U.S. label owner to that point. After his groundbreaking work with the 60s wall of sound groups, his career became sporadic and ineffective as his personal life began to unravel. Spectre's first marriage was in 1963 to Annette Mirror, Mirror, I'm not sure, um, lead vocalist of the Spectre's Three, a 1960s pop trio formed and produced by Spectre. He named the record company after her, Annette Records. While still married to Mirror, he began having an affair with Veronica Bennett, later known as Ronnie Spectre. Beck Bennett was the lead singer of the girl group, The Ronettes, which was the picture up here. I believe this is Ronnie. I'm not 100% sure. Um, they married in 1968 and adopted a son, Dante Phillips Spector. For a Christmas present, Spector surprised her by adopting twins, kind of random, uh, Louis Phillips Spector and Gary Phillips Spector. A little obsessed with his own name, as you can see, all the boys have the same middle name. Weird. His name. Uh, Bennett alleged in her 1990 memoir, Be My Baby, How I Survived Mascara, Miniskirts, and Madness, Spectre being the madness, that Spectre had imprisoned her in her California mansion and subjected her to years of psychological torment. He's crazy. Ugh. Yeah, not good. According to Bennett, Spectre sabotaged her career by forbidding her to perform, and she escaped from the mansion barefoot with the help of her mother in 1972. Phil Spectre's nuts. In their 1974 divorce settlement, she forfeited all future re record earnings and surrendered custody of their children. Getting divorced back in the day was not uh, quite like it is now. Um, it was definitely a much more, what's the word? Like it's still, it's still not good. I'm not saying divorce now is good, but um, like he was a powerful man. You know what I mean? So like she, you know, I mean, like, she was not going to come out on top of that situation, even though she was the one being abused. It's crazy. Um, so, yeah, she, he got custody of the kids and all the future record earnings. Uh, she alleged this was because Spe Spectre threatened to hire a hitman to kill her. Cuckoo. <clears throat> Spectre's sons, Gary and Dante, both stated that their father kept them captive as children, and they were forced to simulate sexual acts with his girlfriend. Yikes. 
Yikes, yikes, yikes. Phil Spector. No bueno. In the 1980s, Spector had twin children with his then-girlfriend Janice Zavala, and they are named Nicole Audrey Spector and Philip Spector Jr. Philip Jr. died of leukemia in 1991. On September 1st, 2006, Spector, while on bail and awaiting trial, married his third wife, Rochelle Short, who was 26 at the time. Ew. Spector filed for divorce in April of 16, claiming irreconcilable differences. The escalating oddness, oddness is a very polite way of saying it, came to an apex, which means like came to a point, um, in 2003, when actress Lana Clarkson was found dead from a bullet wound in Spector's home. He maintained to authorities and the media that she had accidentally shot herself. From 2007 to 2009, he was the subject of two trials, the second of which ended in a guilty verdict. He is serving a prison sentence of 19 years to life, and he will be eligible for parole in 2025. And this is everyone's favorite part of this packet when we look at these photos. Yikes! His mugshot here, he looks like Gollum from Lord of the Rings. And here he is sitting in court. Yikes, right? Okay, so he went from looking like this to this. And this is why we uh, ooh, shake our heads and marvel at Phil Spector. Now, I'm not trying to glorify um, his actions because he's clearly insane and did a lot of harm to a lot of people. But what he did in his early career was still techniques being used to this day. I mean, his, his work in the studio is why we're talking about him and his ability to churn out pop hits and to create... Um, like almost little mini works of art in pop music. So anyway, all right. So here we have our definitions. Again, I'd like you to open this. You're going to click open with and then annotate with Cami. It's this little purple circle with the K. If that will not open, try restarting your Chromebook and then try again. If that will not open, then just type the definitions in a separate Word document and then email it to me. Okay. Hopefully I'd prefer you to use Cami if you can. But if you can't, a separate Word document is fine. Go ahead and define these six things. And then here are our listening jots for the wall of sound. Okay? So you're going to go over to Spotify. And you're going to look up, I think it's just called Wall of Sound and doo -wop is the playlist. I'm not certain, but you're looking for songs by the Crystals, Tina Turner, the Ronettes, and the Righteous Brothers, and one by the Teddy Bears, which was Phil Spector's band. <gasps> My computer's going to die. Okay, so please do those listening jots. Also, don't just write, I liked it, I didn't like it. Write what you're hearing, especially talking about everything we just mentioned with the layers and the strings and the percussion and the vocals and the big sound. Like, really talk about those things um, in your jots. Okay, I hope you all are having a good day. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.